have to both go to the field of reference of the neutral particle and the accelerated particle. If all the charge to mass ratios in the world were the same, all the elementary particles have the same charge to mass, then you could eliminate it. But it's not the case. So electromagnetism is real, gravity is fake, at least look. But gravity is not fake in the global sense. When you have non-trivial gravitational fields, that is gravitational fields with radiance, you cannot eliminate it. So if you go to a large enough spaceship, you'll find that when you drop two, uh, drop two objects, they don't fall in the same direction, they fall towards each other. Since all bodies fall together, they drop together, what can do the trajectory is the property of space-time and not of the body. So now I'll show you that falling bodies follow the geodesics of curved space-time. And the argument is very simple. Suppose I have a curved space time. Let's pretend that the ball is curved. And the particle is following some path like that. Okay. This is a neutral particle, not subject to electromagnetic forces. At any point here, I look around there. I go to a local inertial frame. I know I can apply the laws of special relativity. Because I already know those laws. There's no gravitational field locally. When I go to the frame, I find that it's taking the maximum time to go from here to there any other deviation will cause the time to be reduced. So neighboring points on the curve have maximized the time difference between them. That means if I add up all these things together, the total time from here to there is actually the maximum for the geodesic curve. That tells you how particles move in gravitational fields. Right, is that clear? There will be only one curve which maximizes, well, in a curved space, in a reasonably curved space, there will be a curve from here to there which maximizes the the time taken to go from here to there. I know it's a maximum time because if it is not, suppose there was another curve here with a longer time, I could go here and then this curve would have a longer time. So every small piece, what I'm saying is that if I have a curve which is straight in the sense of being the longest time, it must be straight everywhere. No part of it can be curved. If any part had a non-zero acceleration, then it would not be the longest time. Yeah? Acceleration, I mean acceleration in the local frame, which is available to me at that time. So this is actually quite advanced topics in geometry, but we are getting there from a very uh, elementary point of view. So, okay, now I'll, I think I have very little time for the radiation. I might have to postpone it a little bit. Um, so c consider, I mean, I, I don't know what I should I quit today or not. Oh. So these are curves. This are planes. And suppose I'm in a plane, and I have these coordinates which are curved like this. These curves are not straight. They're curved. And they have a constant curvature. At every point, they have the same curvature. So these curves are curves of constant curvature. And if I go to a coordinate system, which is not x and y, but r and theta, I start saying different effects. The equation of a straight line is, doesn't have a linear relation between r and theta. Things will look curved when they're actually straight. Similarly, if I go to Minkowski space, I can draw a corresponding idea. These are the lines. If I write x equal to r cos theta, and y is equal to r sin theta, I end up with coordinate systems of the kind we saw just now. But I could also write t is equal to shine uh, down and nice and uh, x, x is equal to shine cos down. And go to a new coordinate system where the lines of constant Zai are lines that look like this. They are hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. So here they are not circles, but because of the relative minus sign, the circles are described by x squared plus y squared equal to constant. But I can look at curves where t squared minus x squared over c squared is constant. And I get curves which are hyperbolic. Yeah, these are curves. Now these guys are curves of constant acceleration. I told you that acceleration is the same as curvature. So these are uniformly accelerated observers. And by seeing what 
By working on what a uniformly accelerated observer would see, you can learn a lot about gravity and curved space time. That's what we're going to do in the next talk. So let's get to the, yeah, let's quickly get to this. So there's a problem with that equivalence principle. So this frame is called a Rinder frame. A frame which is uniformly accelerated is called a Rinder frame. People coming from here at the speed of light accelerate and go off at the speed of light. So suppose you have a particle which is at rest in the Rinder frame. Does it radiate at all? I mean a charge particle. Suppose I put the charge particle over here. It follows this path. According to the uniformly accelerated observer, that particle is at rest, it should not radiate. According to the Minkowski observer, who follows world lines which are straight up like this, he would say that the particle is accelerating and it should radiate. So it looks like there's a conflict with the equivalence principle. Any ideas? So the resolution actually is surprisingly subtle. When you ask the question, does it radiate or not? The question which we ask in natural language assumes that everybody agrees on what radiation is. Yeah. The fact of the matter is that radiation is a very frame dependent notion. It varies when you go from one frame to the other. For example, you can write down the ele electromagnetic fields caused by a charged particle going along this world line and show that in this region, it has pure electric fields. It's a charge at rest, so it only produces a pure electric field. And a pure electric field is not radiation. So this guy will not see it radiating. The regular observer will not see it radiating. And the Minkowski observer will see it, see the same electric field as having both electric and magnetic components. And therefore, he will see radiation. Now that radiation is all in this region, where he sees a time-dependent field, which is, uh, from which he can extract energy if he wants to, as a radiation. Whereas the real observer will not see radiation. Now that we understand that radiation is a frame dependent notion, it tells us a lot of things about physics now. Uh, so they differ on whether there is radiation or not. But radiation consists of photons. So it says that it can happen that one observer sees photons, whereas the other one does not. So the notion of a particle is frame dependent. That's one of the reactions, one of the deductions from these arguments. Separation of a field into a Coulomb path and a radiation path is a field dependent notion. And the same EM fields can be described differently by different observers. So we know that energy depends on the frame of reference, and radiation is energy. And it's not entirely surprising that radiation also depends on the frame of reference. So I think this part, okay, I, I will take this up next time. Let's talk. I'll, I'll start from this point. is not very clear. You have to decide which is your frame. And in that frame, you'll either see a particle or not see a particle. And there's a probabilistic notion whether you see a particle or not. If you're looking with a detector, you'll sometimes click and sometimes not click. So quantum theory brings in a new level of complexity. So the, the Okay, here we will have to apply quantum theory. No, it, this part was classical. When I'm talking about radiation being frame dependent, but then I made one more jump to say that radiation consists of photons and particles. So that part is quantum. So that means more thought. Yeah, yeah. You talked about how uh, part, the particles are frame dependent. So you may have a particle in one frame. Which is not that another frame. So is this true just for photons or can it be extended to? It can be extended for all particles. For photons, it's easier to create yeah. because they're masses. But if you go at very high accelerations, you can see other particles as well. So uh, what I was going to say in this lecture actually, if you're in a uniformly accelerated frame, you see a thermal bath of particles. Right? 
that's the unruh effect, which I was going to come to. I'll come to it later. Now, if they're at a very high acceleration, the temperature also is very high. And if the temperature is high enough to be comparable to mc squared, if kt is equal to 2 mc squared, you'll start seeing particles which are like electrons. That corresponds to a very high temperature and a very high acceleration, and therefore a very high gravitation. Sir, so, what if the uh, radiation from the horizon is high enough to burn the observer in the Rinder's uh, space? In Minkowski's space chain, the observer in, uh, like in a non space, sure, in a space, we'll see that he's burning. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there is no force of burning because there is no radiation for him. No, no, no. That's not the way to look at it. But firstly, what do we do when the Rinder observer burns? We put flowers on the screen. <laughs> no, but see, there are two observers. One guy is going like this. He sees no particles. And he sees this guy burning up. What he says is that this guy is accelerating with his detector. Right? And his acceleration is what is causing all those particles. What is causing it to He's done a foolish experiment where he burns himself. No? So he put flowers in his brain and make good speeches about his life. <laughs> Yeah, one last question. Is you, do you receive the part which takes the maximum time? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, uh, it follows the principle of least action? Yeah, the principle of least action is exactly equivalent to this thing. So that's the advanced notion from mechanics. All you have to do to make peace between your mind and this thing is to put a minus sign between the action and the, and the, the time. So you have minus NCTS as the action for a relativistic part, where TS is the property. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll continue with the lecture series tomorrow at 12 p.m. here at NKLC. Hope to see you all there. We will now move on for the event. I just want to make an announcement. At uh, 2 o'clock, huh, I'd be happy to meet anybody who is interested in discussing these things further. Yeah? If you don't have another class. And if I work out the difference, if I work out the difference between the Newtonian potential and infinity and the Newtonian potential and the surface of the Earth, Divide that by c squared, I get a dimension less number. Gm upon c squared r, where r is the radius of the earth. So Gm upon c squared has got the same dimensions as r, which you can easily check if you would like to. And it turns out that this quantity rs, it's called the Schwarzschild radius of the earth, is one centimeter. It's a very tiny radius. So one centimeter divided by the radius of the earth is 10 to the power of minus 9. So this is the total gravitational redshift. If I set a photon of frequency mu from here to infinity, it will encounter the redshift of 10 to the power of minus 9 in Doppler factors. Now, it might come as a surprise to you that two observers who are not moving relative to each other have a, a Doppler shift. Because we started out by saying the Doppler shift is due to relative motion. But now it looks like the gravitational field also can cause a Doppler shift, a change of frequency. So I'm pursuing the same line, taking the Doppler shift all the way into jet relativity. There's a Doppler shift even for observers who are not in relative motion. Now this effect has been measured in the lab many, many times. Yeah. Only Schwarzschild radius came into picture Yeah, actually, I have just, uh, uh, I've argued that the difference in potential is this guy. I'm just calling this the Schwarzschild radius. The reason I'm calling it the Schwarzschild radius is that if you take the Earth, and compress it to the size of uh, one centimeter, which is about this much, you'll get a black hole. Yeah? So it's called the Schwarzschild radius for that reason. So for the sun, the Schwarzschild radius is three kilometers. But for the Earth, it's one centimeter. But uh, without getting into anything like black holes, I've produced a full cool argument to show by this thought experiment, plus the redshift, that there is a redshift which is given by this drop, delta v being given by this factor. Actually, it should be 1 minus this factor, because, yeah. I mean, this is the change of frequency in general. There's a Doppler shift even for observers who are not in relative motion. Now, this effect has been, uh, has been measured by 
wind wheel. That's the most recent measurement. You can take two aluminum ion clocks. So basically, this is telling you that clocks tick at different rates when they are at a different height. So for example, if there's an aluminum ion clock at this point and this point, differing by 30 centimeters, you can send signals from this one and receive it there, and you'll find that there is a red shift, which can be measured. The two clocks don't run at the same right, uh, rate. And actually, this is the measurement of time can be done very accurately in labs. It's probably one of the best measurements for it, which is why we've been using clocks from the beginning and doing away with rulers. So this has been me uh, measured to a fantastic accuracy, and we know that clocks slow down in a gravitational field. That's going to change our views of space and time when we have uh, gravity. Maybe this is a good point to pause. I just ask if you, if you have any. Yes, yes, it's true for every clock. Hmm? Yeah. So if you want to live longer, get into a well. How should we do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> strong gravitation. Strong gravitation. Get into a strong gravitational field. But if you get to a very strong gravitational field, you'll find that your body will be pulled apart by it. <laughs> so don't go that far, but get to a strong Stay low, keep low. <laughs> keep your head down a little longer. But the gain is very tiny. It's not very much. It's of this one. <coughs> yeah, the, the, there's only one clock. I mean, the thing is that when you measure, you see, we all have clocks in our hearts. Hearts are pumping. And that's a clock. But there's also the rate at which cells divide. That's another clock. All these clocks are not as good as atomic clocks. And what we're talking about is the time that transcends everything. Yeah. So, uh, this kind of geometry that is emerging, it follows the first four axioms of the Euclidean geometry and just violates the fifth one. Or... But we, we, yeah, you're right about that, but we haven't got there yet. I have to still prove to you that this means that space time is curved. So, even the first side works in light. Uh, do not uh, call it, uh, like they uh, are at different rates, they work at different rates. Uh, well, light is a clock in itself. No, if you have, light itself has got a periodic structure. Everything which has got a periodic structure. Time itself is being formed by, by gravitation. So, yeah. actually in the equation m del psi by c square is equal to, the, equa the equation maybe, I think that it's dimensionally wrong. Oh, I think I've probably made a mistake. Delta phi by c square is dimensionless. No, tell me again, what's the question? Actually, m del psi is basically energy. Uh, uh, that see, second equation, new, energy. Uh, h nu is energy. No, sir, that, that second equation. That's m del psi by c square is equal to. The right hand side is basically energy, and del psi is it's, itself it is energy. C square should be. Oh, c square should be. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. C square should be. Somewhere, where, where should we so there should be a C squared on the right hand side. Below, below. yes, that's true. There should be an M below C squared. Very good. Thank you. So I wrote these in a hurry, of course. Okay. Let's get on to the let's get on to the proof that space time is curved, starting from this. So let's do it in a slightly larger detail. I know that if I take a small separation in height. By the way, when I say z coordinate, I don't mean z coordinate as measured with uh, this thing. This thing, remember, we got rid of it long ago. We don't do the same thing. We measure heights by sending light signals. So the z which I'm talking about here is the vertical coordinate measured as usual by exchange of light signals. And the differential equation that tells you how the Doppler shift acts is du by dz is minus mu upon c squared times d pi by dz. So I can take logarithms. d mu upon u is the log of d by d set of logs. And then you can rewrite the equation like this and solve a simple differential equation to find that the Doppler shift at phi height z is given by mu naught times exponential of minus phi of z over c squared. I think this is dimensionally correct. Now, I want to consider an experiment where there is a clock at this height I mean, there's an observer at this height with a clock here, another guy here, and another guy here, at different heights. So this height is A, as measured by, the, by these methods. And this height is twice A. The Doppler shift from here to there, I'm going to normalize it so that the base frequency is at new dot, which is over here. And this formula tells me what the frequency is at all other heights. 
I find that the, the, the redshift going from here to here is delta 1, which is this quantity. And the redshift going from here to there is delta 2, which is this quantity. Now, take a look at the next figure. I'm doing the same experiment now. This is z here and time here. I'm plotting z on the horizontal axis, which is a little confusing, because normally we think of z as upwards. But I've always been plotting time in the vertical. And I'm not, without prejudice, I'm just drawing the lines of light that's going like this. I don't want to assume anything about those curves. If you look at this figure, you find that this figure here and and this figure here, which is twice the size in any sense of the term, are not exactly similar. Because although I have doubled it, this side has gone over there. This, yeah, uh, see, consider this figure here. Consider this uh, figure here, which is like a, whatever it, it is, and then the figure which is over here. I've made sure that this side is the same as this, so that this whole thing is twice this one. And because of the Doppler shift, you find that unless delta 2 is equal to delta 1, the big figure is not similar to this one. Yeah? Under what condition is delta 2 equal to delta 1? You can see from here that if delta 2 is equal to delta 1, the potential at twice the height must be twice the potential at once the height. That means to say, and since you, you could have taken three times, four times, or any lambda times, you prove that this function must be linear. In other words, only in a constant gravitational field is there no curvature. Whenever the gravitational field is not constant, if there's a gradient of the gravitational field, you do have curvature. So you violate the fifth postulate of Newton. That given any figure, there are similar figures. That's, that doesn't work anymore. So we are now in curved space time. That is the absolute main point of this. I hope it's clear. Yeah. Now, if I wanted to demonstrate the redshift, I can do it with a slinky like this. Just look at this. Suppose there's a clock here, everything here. As it goes up, think of this as the wavelength. The wavelength keeps on increasing, and now the wavelength is much larger. Okay. This is just a way of showing you what happens to the light. Light is everything here with strong wave, I mean, with uh, small wavelength. As it, as it goes up the gravitational field, the, gra the wavelength keeps on increasing and it becomes larger here. I'm assuming a very strong gravitational field, which is not really present, but I'm exaggerating for effect, which is an allowed trait. So is it here now that space time is curved? So we started off by giving a special rule to straight lines. And now we have a problem. Because now we're dealing with curved spacetime. What is a straight line in a curved spacetime? So let's go back to the idea of straight. What do I mean by a straight line? A straight line is the shortest distance between the same points or the longest distance, depending on what kind of geometry you are in. Now, if you are doing something different, for example, if you are doing that, that's a curve. So that's curvature of one kind. And curvature is the same as acceleration. In physics, we call curvature as acceleration. Yeah. So curvature is the same as acceleration. And uh, quite incidentally, I was talking to a very distinguished mathematician. He believes that the most important idea of mathematics is curvature, which is the same as acceleration. In the most elementary form, you can think of it as acceleration itself. <coughs> that itself, to him, is the deepest idea that has entered mathematics from physics, the idea of acceleration. And actually, this is uh, Professor M. S. Arsuman, one of the best mathematicians in the country. So the, those observers who do not have acceleration are called inertial observers. And in curves, we can see curvature as well as acceleration, depending on whether you talk about geometry or dynamics. So the same thing which is called curvature in geometry is called acceleration in physics. But now we'd like to talk about more general surfaces than the plane. We started by saying we wanted to talk about Euclidean geometry that we understand very well. 
And now I want to talk about more general surfaces. So one example of a general surface is this ball over here. So if I take the ruler, for example, it is flat. It, I can lay it flat on the table. But the ball doesn't fit onto the table. If I look at the bottom over there, the point of contact, and imagine traversing <coughs> the surface of that sphere at unit speed, I will get an acceleration which is given by v squared upon r, the centrifugal acceleration. Let's put v equal to 1. And so the curvature there is basically 1 by r. Inverse of the radius of curvature of the ball is the curvature of the ball along that direction. But I can traverse the point in all directions. And for the sphere, it doesn't matter. In all directions, I get exactly the same radius of curvature. But I can think of other surfaces. Let me think of something yeah, here. Now, if I take this bottle here, if I come down this way, there's one curvature. If I come down this way, there's a different curvature. Yeah? The two curvatures are not equal. You can show that there's a direction of minimum curvature and maximum curvature. Maximum curvature and minimum curvature. These two directions are at 90 degrees to each other. That can be shown quite generally. Yeah? And the sum of these two curvatures is called, well, the average of these two curvatures is called the mean curvature. And the product of these two curvatures is called the Gaussian curvature, or the intrinsic curvature. Yeah? That's just a definition. So what really matters to, the, to a bug living on the bottle is the intrinsic curvature. It cannot detect the extrinsic curvature at all. It only depends on the intrinsic curvature. So there are all kinds of things you can do to learn about curvature. So here's one example. Take a sheet of paper like this and draw a figure. And now what I've done is to make a triangle. One vertex, the other one, sorry, I've drawn a, a biangle. This is a biangle. It's a polygon which has got only two sides. Euclid never saw a polygon with just two sides. Because in Euclidean geometry, if you take two points and join them, there's only one line that joins them. Here, there's a, these two points have been joined by this line as well as the straight line. So biangles don't exist in Euclidean geometry, but they do in curvature. So where's the curvature here? It's all concentrated at this point, at the tip of the cone. And you also notice that this one, I'll show it to you with this one. Here's a triangle. It's got three vertices, one, two, three. And each of the angles is 90. So the sum of the angles of this triangle is not 180, it's 270 degrees. Yeah? So by cutting paper, you can actually imagine curved space. And uh, there's another trick you can do. Let me do that now. Yeah, actually, I should just uh, make this a little firmer and pass it around. Maybe I can ask you to just can you stick this with okay? And uh, can you stick this one with seven? Okay? I just pass it around so everybody can look at it. While I'm waiting for uh, Saurav to do his step, yeah. it's possible. It's possible. <coughs> so can one see a uh, very dramatic thing if one does it on a Mobius strip? Normal cylinder is flat. Yes. Mobius strip is also is also flat. Flat, but. Because it's non-orientable. Yes. yes. Um, 
Yeah, and the is, yeah I, I would like to evade that question because of recent topology. I want to stick with geometry. Yes? Yeah, so okay. I've defined uh, the principal curvatures, which are the two maximum and minimum curvatures. The mean is the Gaussian curvature. There's a beautiful theorem due to. Okay, but I've not told you what a negatively curved surface is. So this is the surface where if you draw a triangle like this, the sum of the angles will actually be less than one inch difference. And uh, I'll ask somebody to do that laboriously. Just mark three points. Okay, maybe I'll do it. I'll mark three points here. And I, yesterday I was very dismissive of rulers. I still don't approve of rulers. <laughs> So each of these is a straight line because I'm drawing it to the ruler. that you get on a negatively curved space. Here also there is, yeah, there's a lot to be learned by just drawing triangles. If you draw a small triangle anyway, even on the sphere, you will not see the difference. But when you start drawing bigger and bigger triangles, you start noticing that the fingers are no longer similar. The lengths may be raised in proportion, but the angles don't remain the same. The angles, angles are a bit of smaller or bigger, depending on the sign of the curvature. You also notice that for the ball, if I make a tangent at some point, like this, the ball is on one side of the tangent. Whereas for this guy, the ball, I mean, I can, if I take a tangent at any point, it's on both sides of the tangent. I can't really draw a plane through this. Yeah, so actually, I encourage you to play around with paper, with scissors and cello tape. You can learn a lot about curvature. And I've talked about both positive and negative curvature. So in this point, the curvature is, this is one curve, that's the other curve. The centers of curvature are the same side, so this has got positive curvature. Whereas if I look over here, it's curved this way. The center is outside, and it doesn't reach the centers of the other side. So if the two centers are on opposite sides, you get negative curvature. So if you take a bottle like this and draw curves like that, triangles here, you'll find that the angles are not quite, yeah, less, uh, are less than 180. And to draw lines, you have to make, take a string and make them tight. You can, do all this by when you spend for your next day. The science of curvature is like the story of one. And the idea that the intrinsic geometry of the surface is determined only by the product of the two curvatures is a very famous <coughs> theorem due to Gauss. Gauss called it the theorema egregium, which is a Latin word that means the big metric I want to talk about. Let's suppose you take a surface, an arbitrary surface, I can define the surface by giving the height as a function of x and y. For example, I could take this ball and I can write x squared plus y squared to the power of half. This will describe the surface of the ball because I know I can write x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to 1 and this defines the surface of the sphere. Take, solve this for z and you'll get this equation where, in fact, you can also put something here, r times the radius, radius times this. Uh, I'm not sure that's it. One point minus one point. Yeah. So, it's, uh, that's right. That's a sphere with radius 1. But I could also just write x squared plus y squared over 2. And this will describe, I mean, 
approximately like x squared plus y squared over 2. And this will describe the scale of some radius around the, in the region around the bottom. So the metric of space is dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared, according to Euclid in three dimensions. Suppose I had a surface described by the following two. This is the sub part of x and y, of which this is an example. If I plug it in here, I get d x squared plus d y squared plus d f over d x times d x plus d f over d y times d y whole squared. Now if I collect all the terms, I get d x squared times 1 plus f x squared plus d y squared times 1 plus y squared plus dx dy times uh, fx dy <coughs> possibly with 2. So this can be thought of as a description of the geometry of the surface, the intrinsic geometry. And you notice that it, it depends on space, so it could the principle depend on where you are on the surface. So the general form is something times dx squared plus something times dy squared plus something times dx dy where all these somethings are functions of x and y. That's the general form of the metric on a curve surface. Now I'm going to put a dirty trick now. Just given any point on any curved surface, given any point anywhere, I take that point and press it against the table and set up my axis in such a way that xy plane is the table. Yeah? This has the great effect that at a point, you can make fx and fy vanish. So this goes away, this goes away, and that goes away. And you just have dx squared plus dy squared. So in any surface, I can use this trick to introduce quarters so that the first derivatives of the metric vanish. So that's, that is something very deep that we're going to come back to. It's the idea that Einstein used to go to the general theory of energy. So the vanishing of the first derivatives can be arranged by just the intelligent choice of coordinates in any The principle of the equivalence is something that was, uh, well, it was uh, exploited by Einstein. It goes uh, like this. You start with the observation that all bodies fall at the same rate in the gravitational field. Mm -hmm. This is an experimental fact. And it's been known for a long time that, uh, that if you drop a cannonball and a feather in a vacuum, the two will fall together. It's independent of the mass. It's independent of the composition. It doesn't matter whether you drop aluminum or gold. It all falls together. Now, if all bodies fall together, you can form with those bodies and eliminate gravity entirely. You can go to, into a weightless frame of reference. So once you're in that frame of reference, you've eliminated gravity. So the principle of equivalence says that gravity is the same as acceleration. That is, you can simulate gravity by producing acceleration, and you can eliminate gravity by going to an accelerator. So in other words, gravity does not exist. It's a pseudo force. You know about the Coriolis force, the wind on the earth. I mean, the wind on the winds on the earth, when they wind from north to south, they are deflected. And this is very important to meteorologists who can predict the weather because of this. But that's because the earth is a rotating frame of reference. If you go to a non-rotating frame of reference, a body which is moving in a certain direction will keep going in that direction. Coriolis force is a pseudo force that can be eliminated. What Einstein noticed is that gravity too is a pseudo force which can be eliminated by going to a suitable frame. So then, what is the problem with quantum gravity then? Because there is no gravity. So why not just go home? There's no gravity anyway. We can eliminate gravity. <laughs> So the answer is that gravity can only be eliminated locally because if you look at situations like this, the strong a gravitational field of the Earth, things are falling towards it, and the value of the, the direction of the force of gravity here is different from the force of gravity here. So you cannot simultaneously el eliminate gradients of gravity fields, and that's exactly what we noticed with the redshift effect that if you have a great gradient of a gravitational field, it implies curvature. So you can eliminate a constant gravitational field by falling with it, 
but you cannot eliminate a very gravitational field. Yeah? So that is the theory of general relativity, which tells you that gravitation is encoded in the geometry of space-time. And at any point, you can forget about gravity by going to a local frame of reference. Now we can derive a lot of things just from this idea. Sir? Yeah. So, so any force field can be eliminated locally then? Well, only gravity. Why? Why only gravity? Uh, electromagnetic force, if I take a particle which is neutral and a particle which is charged, they will follow different paths. Okay, because ma it is mass, which yeah. is... So let, let, let me let me explain this. See the the f equal to m a will will determine the motion of the particle. Because m is sitting here and gravity also has m. That's So these two equations, you can eliminate the force and then recognize that this m and that m cancel out. There is some suspicion that the two m's may not be the same. Yeah? But that, that, that suspicion is removed by doing experiments. You do experiments with all kinds of different met materials. Such experiments were done by Newton, Bessel, Yorkosh, Bregensky, large number of people. Nobody's ever been able to find a difference between these two quantities. So let's believe that it's the same and cancel it out. Then we find that we can eliminate gravity by just following it. Provided the field is new.
Yeah, what you just saw was the Doppler effect. And yesterday what I did was to show you that you could understand all of special relativity, just starting from the Doppler effect. But what I did show you here was not the Doppler effect with light, because as I pointed out yesterday, that is impossible in, in a laboratory like this. But of course, we can do it in astrophysics, and you can see red shifts all over the place. There are objects which move with very high velocities comparable to the speed of light. And you don't see the red shift in astrophysics. And even, actually, the Doppler shift is often used by police cars for detecting speeders. So they have more sensitive equipment than I do here. But the difference between the sound Doppler effect and the light Doppler effect is the role of air. Because in relativity, there's only the source and the receiver. In empty space time, there's only the source and the receiver. There are only two frames of reference. Whereas when you talk about the sound Doppler effect, there are three frames. There is the source, the receiver, and the this frame of the air. Also. As a result, some of the conceptual things about the Doppler effect are, dif are different here. But what is similar is the following idea, that when a source which is emitting moves away from you, between beeps, there's going to be some motion, and that will increase the distance, and there will be a Doppler effect. The qualitative fact of the Doppler effect does not depend on whether you have air or not. It's the same argument in both cases. The exact formula is different. And I would advise you to work out the formula for sound based on the arguments which I gave you for light. There are differences. There are also similarities. It's very interesting to explore the differences and the similarities between the sound Doppler effect and the light Doppler effect. And it would be even more interesting to do a michelson Morley Michael experiment with sound. Many of you have done the same experiment with light in the laboratory. What you need is a moving fluid, and you can send rays of sound, the ultrasound, sound, for example, one way and the other way, and devise an experiment to demonstrate that if there was ether, there would be uh, an effect of this kind of wave. I think that's a very interesting challenge for whoever is interested in experimenting with it, to do an experiment that shows the Michelson Morley effect with sound. The, the same experiment with light gives you a null answer, but with sound you should get a non zero answer. Yeah, yesterday one of the, there were several questions. One of them was that people said they were not very familiar with hyperbolic functions. I don't think this is true for everyone, but there were some people who felt challenged by hyperbolic functions. I'm going to run through it very quickly. Firstly, I took alpha as the log of delta. The reason for that was that delta, the Doppler shift, was a multiplicative quantity. And when you take logs, you get an additive quantity. That's the reason that logs were introduced in the first place. Napier introduced logs to them so you could reduce multiplication to addition. So by taking the logs, you just have to add the alphas, and that led to the addition of velocity. Delta is the exponential of alpha. We can separately define the exponential function by means of a power series, which looks like this. Now we're getting into mathematics, and it's good for you to learn some mathematics. Let's alpha be imaginary for a moment. You all know complex numbers, the square root of minus one. Yeah. So you take alpha to be i times theta. When you write down the same expression, you find that there's some i's that come in when there are odd alphas, there are some i's that come in. And here, for example, there's an i, but here there's a minus i. When you look at this guy, you can collect all the terms which have an i in it and call that sine theta. All the terms which don't have an i in it as a cos theta. So that's the odd and even parts of this function. If for y theta can be separated from odd and even parts. Very similarly, you take each of the alpha, you can separate it into its even and odd parts. And this is the even part and that's the odd part. I've plotted both these things. These are trigonometric functions. Here's the cosine function, which is even in blue, and the sine function, which is odd in red. You can see it's odd because it goes to zero here. And here's the hyperbolic function. This is the cosine function, which goes through 1 at 0 and is always greater than 1, unlike the cosine function, which is always less than 1. And here's the shine function, which is a uh, odd function. It goes to 0. And then that is just a quick uh, run through of hyperbolic functions. Now, there's another question about uh, what does it physically mean? That's a question that's a little hard to understand. I want to explain my attitude towards that question. See, when you're trying to understand physics, we often ask questions in language, in natural language. So the person who asks the question should actually try to make an effort 
to convert this question into an experiment. If not a real experiment, at least a thought experiment. That's the way you make a question precise. You can also convert your questions into mathematical calculations. So starting with natural language, which we use to communicate every day, we can also convert those questions into experiments or into mathematical calculations. And when you ask a question, try to make it as operational as possible. By which I mean you try to make it into a real challenge to an experiment. Now, one of the things I'm doing here is to make your life simpler, is to always work with low dimensional examples, not challenge you too much with four dimensions so that you can visualize it better. But even then, because we're dealing with uh, Minkowski geometry rather than Euclidean geometry, many of you will feel challenged. It takes some getting used to. But it helps to keep the whole thing low dimensional. I'm also using analogies between light and sound, for example, in order to put my points across. These are tricks of the trade by which I get through to you, but with a slight bit of dishonesty. That is, I'm not telling you the, the whole story, the whole complicated story. I'm simply finding it wherever I can. And that, that is precisely my job, to try to give you the illusion of an understanding, which you can one day convert into a reality. So apart from the things which I already talked about, here is uh, yeah, the last, let's draw a triangle with time on this axis, space on this axis, and the hypotenuse here. So you're all familiar with the idea that the adjacent, angle, the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse is the cosine, cosine actually, but now I'm talking about cosines. And similarly, the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, this is x, should be x over c, gives you the sine hyperbolic. And the tan is x over ct, which you will recognize as the velocity divided by the speed of light. So these are, these are all questions that, were, uh, that are better answered today than they were yesterday. Finally, there's a question that Priyanka asked about energy. When you go from one frame to the other, why does it change? I was, this was in the context of photons that were being emitted and caught in a black box. And when the photons are converted into heat, heat has got energy, and energy has got mass. That was the line of my argument. So she was questioning why energy is different in different frames. So in that context, there are two words I'd like to distinguish. One of them is invariant, and the other is conserved. And I want to explain the difference between these two words. So a quantity set to be invariant if it's the same for all observers. An example of an invariant is t squared minus x over c whole squared. This is invariant because it's the same for all observers. And by Conserved. I mean that this is a quantity which is independent of time for the same observer. For example, charge is conserved. Charge is also invariant. But it can happen that you find a quantity which is invariant but not conserved, and conserved but not invariant. What can think of examples of all these things? So by invariance, I mean it's the same for all observers, but conserved, I mean it's independent of time. For example, the charge density is not an invariant because they contract and the charge density changes when you go from one frame to the other. And an example of a conserved quantity is energy. In every frame, energy is conserved, but energy is not an invariant. It's not the same for all observers. And this is true even in Newtonian physics. Suppose you have this chalk right here. Its kinetic energy is zero. Hmm? But if I move with a certain velocity, if I go to a different frame, this chalk will be moving in the opposite direction with the same velocity. And its kinetic energy will be half mv squared. And that energy is very real. If I'm in that frame and that chalk comes and hits me, it will hurt. So it takes energy to hurt. So energy is real and it differs from frame to frame. OK, now we're getting to the talk which I'd actually written, which I'd actually planned to give. So today it's uh, general activity and radiation. And uh, as I mentioned last time, I had some second thoughts about the pace of rise of level. So I kept it very elementary last time. It was all special relativity. And I feel it was about right. Now I'm going to spend half of this lecture talking about general relativity. And only then get into
just fixing it so it doesn't turn off by then. Otherwise, off. So you can understand, understand how far we have come, and also sometimes it suggests which direction we should be moving. You can all, all, already see a pattern from it. Suppose I live in a liquid which is very viscous, like a bacterium lives in a liquid which is very viscous. Viscous. You would think of space-time like this. There's time here. I'm talking about an intelligent bacterium who actually worries about space and time. <laughs> and uh, here's space and here's time. The space is basically the fluid. So the notion of here is very clear. The same particle of fluid occupies the same point of space always. The fluid is at rest. So this is the notion of here for the bacteria. And for a bacteria, the speed of light is practically infinite. So if I send out a signal from here, it will zip across through all of space at infinite speed. So that defines the notion of now. So I have a notion of here, which is very well defined, and a notion of now, which is also very well defined. So Aristotelian space-time is like a graph paper with sheet lines going up as well as sideways. Yes? This is the picture of space-time as we had from Aristotle. Not that Aristotle put it in this mathematical language, but I'm imposing my views on Aristotle, although, I mean, because he cannot challenge me, he's, far, he's been dead a long time. <laughs> so here's Galileo's picture of space and time. You put time on this axis, space on this axis. You lose the notion of here. But you have the notion of now. We still have the speed of light. We can sense light at infinite speed and connect all these points, which are all belong to the same now. But there's no notion of a fixed place in Galilean space time. Because if you had, suppose I say I'm going to meet you at this point at 12.30 tomorrow, 12 hours from now. I'm giving you a time. But when I say I'm going to meet you at this point, this point is only defined by this table, perhaps. In absolute terms, the Earth is flying through space at 30 bytes per second. And here, I, all of us will be somewhere very far away from this point of space. Yeah? So the notion of here does not exist, but the notion of now still exists. So there's less structure in space. It's also interesting that if you look here and ask, what is the set of transformations that keeps the structure invariant. Now we're getting into group theory. It's a little bit of an advanced notion, but just think about it from an elevator point of view. Nothing changes if I move forward in time. So time translations is one symmetry of this space time. Space translations is another. And there's nothing else, because we're in two dimensions. If we were in higher dimensions, there would be rotations also. But we want to stick to two dimensions. Now if I come here, I have still translations in time and translations in space. There's still symmetries. But there's a new possibility. I can move with a uniform velocity. That's the Galilean transformation. Space-time does not change. So I go from the space-time with a symmetry of 2 to a symmetry of 3. So that is the improvement of relativity. Yeah? So we have discovered a greater symmetry in space-time than Aristotle had. And the symmetry that Einstein discovered is actually not bigger. Okay, now let's get to Minkowski's space. Minkowski space is ruled by two sets of lines, which are at 45 degrees. This is light which is traveling at a finite speed along this line, and light which is traveling with a finite speed along this line. And notice I've changed the axis. Now it is CT rather than T, because now I'm using the speed of light in an essential way. The finiteness is being used essentially. So you have a grid. It looks like a graph paper, but it's turned through 45 degrees. We don't have a notion of here or now, but we have some new notions set of all points which can be connected by light rays. Okay? And the symmetry of this is exactly as large as the symmetry of this. Because this, these symmetries consist of one, translations here, here, and going to a new frame, that is three, 
And here also we have exactly the same symmetries. We can go through a new frame. We can translate in time and translate in space. So Einstein did not really change the size of the symmetry group. He just changed the way in which the symmetry operates in space. So relativity was an idea that was born with Kelly. It is only modified by Einstein. Now, all the, homo all the spaces we're going to talk about here in this part are homogeneous and isotropic. Even if they're in more dimensions, they would be isotropic in space. We start from Aristotle, went to Galileo, then to Minkowski. And uh, there's a special importance given to inertial observers, those observers who don't have the acceleration. So let me go back to Aristotle now. The, if you don't have any acceleration, or if you don't have any force acting on you, you sit at one point. So observers who are at rest have a preferred status in this kind of space. Here, observers who are at rest have the same status as those who are uniformly moving. So those observers who are not being acted on with forces have a special status. They're called inertial observers. And they, uh, they traverse world lines which are not curved, which are straight. We're beginning to see curvature coming into the whole story. So there's something like uh, preferred observers in all these space types. Inertial observers are preserved, preferred over observers who are subject to a force. Now, before we get into space time and more complicated things, let's take a review of space through the ages. The earliest formalized version of space was the plane geometry of Euclid. It's a beautiful structure, a great example of uh, mathematics being derived from a set of axioms. The axioms are here, they're five in number. And they're very simple to state, and everybody in this room would believe them. Everybody would believe them except the last one. Let's get to the last one later. It says, given any two points, this board is a plane like a leaf. Given any for two points, I can draw a line segment between them. That's one of the axioms. Further, in axiom two, this line segment can be extended infinitely in all directions, in both directions. Thirdly, given a point, let's say this point, and a line segment, I can draw a circle. Those are the axioms, one, two, and three. The fourth axiom states that all right angles are equal. That is, if I have an angle, a right angle here and a right angle here, I can take this by translation and rotation and put it on top of that one. And the fifth, fifth uh, postulate is a little difficult. The way Euclid stated it was the following. That is, if I had a line here and two lines, and if the sum of these two angles is less than 180, these two lines will meet on this side. And if it's more than 180, it will meet on the other side. That was Euclid's version of the fifth postulate. I'm going to choose a slightly different version. And I'm going to talk about it in the sense of scaling variance of the plane. That is, given a figure, I can draw any figure I like. I can draw a larger figure where the distance between any, okay, I can draw a larger figure, maybe I should take it easier figure to draw in the larger figure. So this figure, I'm not sure it's, a, okay, I can draw a larger figure, okay, I can draw it here. Pardon my artistry, which is not uh, exemplary, but this figure and this figure are similar in the sense that I can find a map, given a point anywhere on the first track figure, I can find a map somewhere here. I mean, I can map each point here to some point there, where all the distances are multiplied by the same constant factor. That's what I mean by similar figures. You're used to thinking in terms of angles. I don't want to use angles, because angles go bad when we get to Minkowski geometry. Yeah? So by similar figure, I mean, the fifth postulate states that given any figure, I can draw a similar figure. Okay? It's a sense of scale invariance of the plane. In other words, if the plane has no intrinsic scale. For example, I can measure the plane in terms of inches or centimeters. It doesn't make any difference. Now, this is not true of the sphere. If you take a look at this ball here, just can I pass, can you pass the ball? Yeah. If I draw a tiny triangle here, the sum of the angles will add up to 180. Right? But if I draw it larger, the angles won't add up to 180. And not only that, the distances are not preserved. If I look at the distances between, if I, I mean, the ratios of distances are not preserved when I go to a larger figure on the plane. 
So the sphere does have an intrinsic scale, which is given by the radius of the sphere. The plane does not have an intrinsic <coughs> scale at all. That's the, that is what is special about Euclid. And yeah. for years, people thought that the fifth oscillator should be derivable from the others. But it turned out not to be so. It's an independent oscillator. And there are geometries known where all the first four oscillators are true, but the last one is not. It's called a hyperbolic geometry. It's a space of constant negative curvature. It's a slightly advanced topic. Let's not get into that. OK, now I'm going to explain why this is relevant to relativity. But first, let's notice that uh, today is Einstein's birthday. And he came up with this equation, which I'm going to use in the next slide, to prove by a thought experiment that space and time are good, which is why we have to go beyond Euclid. We, do not, we cannot uh, manage, we have to give up the last positive when we're talking about space. So consider this experiment. This is an experiment which you would set up here if you wanted to. But it's an experiment that will produce a perpetual motion machine. It will solve all the energy problems of not only the world, but also the city. Well, uh, not only the city, but also the world. So it consists of the following device. You've got two wheels here and a pulley going around. And these are buckets. By the way, uh, many of the ideas I'm talking about are due to Herman Bondi. He's a very distinguished cosmologist. And he likes to think about things in a very operational and practical sense. So this is, this is the story of Bondi's buckets. Uh, yeah, I think the reason Bondi was obsessed with buckets is that he, uh, well, he's the night commander of the bath. And many of us take baths and buckets. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the distinctions that he had. That he had, he's passed away now. So these are all buckets. And these buckets on the left contain excited atoms. And these contain de-excited atoms. So we know that the difference in mass between an excited atom and an unexcited atom is E divided by mc squared, where E is h nu. So h nu by mc squared is the difference in mass between the buckets here and the buckets there. Now I'm trying to bring in gravitation. It has to come from somewhere. So I'm doing this, I'm doing this experiment in the gravitational field. So these buckets, because they are more ex there's more energy here, they will have more weight because of E equal to MC squared. And so the buckets on the left side are going to be heavier. This pulley is going to come down, and it's going to rotate forever like that. As the buckets come to the top, what I do, when I come to the bottom here, I de-excite the atoms and send the photons up through two, two mirrors and re-excite the atoms at the top. So this is a perpetual motion machine that can make energy that will solve the world's problems. So why don't we make this machine? It won't work? Why won't it work? Yeah, it violates the law of thermodynamics. But who said the laws of them? Well, who ordered the well, you know, we can violate we can change the constitution. Huh? Why won't this work? No, you're right to be suspicious. There has to be something wrong. But you tell me what is wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but actually when you, you stimulate the emission, the amount of energy you need to de-excite the atom is relatively small. It can be made as small as you like. And to re-excite also, you can just send the photon from here and then re-excite. But to both of, but the photon has to go from down to up, then yeah. it will lose the energy. Good, good. So the point is that when it, the only resolution to this that does not violate the first law of thermodynamics is that you have to supply some energy. When the photon goes from here, it has a certain frequency. When it reaches there, it has a smaller frequency. In other words, photons undergo a gravitational redshift. So this experiment is a thought experiment that proves that there is a gravitational redshift. So what I used was basically Newtonian physics plus E equal to MC squared. And that I can now conclude that if I wanted to re-excite this atom, I would have to supply a little bit of energy there to make up for what I lost when the photon went from the bottom to the top. So this is the redshift effect. And this is, in fact, the most important idea in this talk, that gravity has a redshift. So it has profound consequences. 
So I'm going to uh, go through the algebra a little bit here. I think all of you can take this. Let's consider one particular, uh, well, one particular atom. Its energy, the excess energy, the excited energy minus the unexcited energy is H2, which has a mass of H2 over C squared. So if I were to let this atom drop from the top to the bottom, I would extract an energy of n times delta phi, where phi is the Newtonian gravitational potential. And it's clear that that has to be supplied by the difference between the emitted frequency and the absorbed frequency at the top. So the frequency at the top is the Doppler shift. I'm going to write drop delta here, times new naught. In other words, there's a Doppler shift with delta being less than 1 as I go from the bottom of the gravitational field to the top. Now, that is something you would not have expected. For a start, if I'm talking now, if my voice is at a certain frequency, the people here will hear it at a slightly higher frequency because I'm standing in your city. But the people at the back will hear it at a slightly lower frequency. The difference is so tiny that it's not observable, but it is true. And evaluate these terms quantitatively as we go along. The Newtonian potential on the surface of the Earth is given by this, which is minus g m over r, Newton's constant, the mass of the Earth, divided by the position 